you very much. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, looking forward to trying out these ideas. So, um, on the one hand, some of these ideas I've been thinking about for quite a while. Some of the examples I'm going to talk about are things that I've been working on in papers for a few years. On the other hand, some of this stuff is quite new. I'm trying a new direction. So there's lots of potential for you to have input into this project and tell me where I might be going wrong. Oh, point me towards connections with other work. Okay, so. The mouse is over there and we have to move it to the left. Thing. Is it a thing that we sometimes found? It's probably good. Yeah. All right, of all the things that could go wrong, that's a really tiny one. There you go. Just <laughs> when it keeps happening, it'll be the problem. Okay, so to get you thinking about this topic, it's relatively novel in philosophy to be making this connection between memory and particularly focused on biological memory. The memories of individuals rather than cultural memory, making the connection between that and justice is relatively novel. So we're going to give you an example, hopefully get you thinking that this is worth pursuing this idea, um, that philosophers maybe should be thinking about this a bit more. Okay, so this is an example from US politics from 2018. So when I heard about this example from political life, it actually made me think this is interesting. I feel like philosophers should have something more to say about this example. And I thought the example linked with some of the work I was doing, but on a more abstract level in relation to memory. So what I'm describing here is the response that Christine Blasey Ford had to the nomination of Brett Kavanaugh for Supreme Court Justice by Donald Trump. So. When this person was nominated by Donald Trump, this individual, Christine Blasey Ford, responded by um, bringing forward her account of an alleged assault that Kavanaugh had inflicted on her when they were much younger, 30 odd years before. So in response to Blasey Ford's account of this thing that happened a long time ago, Donald Trump responded in the following way. So this is actually a description of Trump's response from the Guardian newspaper. How did you get home? Trump said, echoing a question Ford was asked by the committee. I don't remember. How did you get there? I don't remember. Where is the place? I don't remember. How many years ago was it? I don't know. What neighborhood was it? I don't know. Where's the house? I don't know. He then went on to allege that Christine Blasey Ford was part of a conspiracy of evil people. So what Trump's doing here is responding to the fact that the account that Blasey Ford gave contains some omissions. So when asked certain questions about what happened at the time of this assault that she alleged to have happened, she wasn't able to provide the details that were demanded of her. She wasn't able to say how she got home. What I think you have here is one particular interpretation of these uh, memory errors or omissions one particular conception of memory being developed and applied. And I think this begins to point towards the importance of having an adequate conception of memory to ensuring that there is justice. Here we have what seems to be a clearly inadequate conception of memory that Trump is putting forward here, that where if someone has an account that they give and there's some gap in that account, then you can conclude on the basis of that evidence that the part of conspiracy of evil people clearly seems to be the wrong direction for the move. Here's an alternative interpretation of the gaps in this individual's memory when she was providing this account of this alleged assault. This is from a psychologist um, on the blog of the Scientific American. The effects of stress on memories formation are time dependent. When the brain detects an attack or stress, sudden, stress, or stress suddenly kicks in, the hippocampus, which plays central roles in encoding information into short-term memory and stirring it, storing it as long-term memories, rapidly enters the superencoding mode. In that phase of stress-induced memory functioning, central details are encoded strongly and peripheral details weakly, if at all. After about 5 to 20 minutes in that state, the hippocampus enters a minimal encoding mode in which the encoding and especially the storage of details, even central ones are severely limited or not happening at all. So this is another response to exactly the same thing that happened. This person provided this account of something that would have been really stress inducing that happened in her past. I mean, someone just reading uh, like a quote from a slide isn't always very helpful. So let's unpack this a bit. 
in this, this interpretation of what's happening, what you need to do is look at the specific effects that stress tends to have on memory. And if you do that, according to the psychologist, you find that when someone has something happen to them that's really stress inducing, at the, at the beginning, when this thing happens, like when an assault begins, their memory systems encode information really well. They store information that can later be retrieved about the core details of what's happening. They might not store information about peripheral details, um, details about, about the setting that they're in or things like that, but they, they do store the core details. And then you've got this time dependency effect where a period after the initial stress inducing event, their memory systems aren't encoding information so well. On this interpretation, this reading of what's happening to Christine Blasey Ford, you've got a way to understand her gaps in her memory, such that those gaps are fully consistent with her providing informative information about the assault that she alleged to have happened, okay? So I think here, this is a really stark example of how conceptions of memory, our understandings of memory can be really crucial to securing social justice and fairness. So in this case, it seems like the fair result if this person has really being attacked is that her testimony should be taken seriously if she's providing more details of the account that are accurate, even if she is providing an account that contains some errors. But if you have a Trump style conception of memory, if you have this sort of blunt, less sophisticated one, that actually I think probably many people still do endorse, then you're less likely to reach the conclusion that this testimony is to be trusted and therefore less likely to endorse the sort of result where this person's uh, account of their assault is taken seriously. So then the aim of this paper or talk is to argue that cases like this one and others I'm going to outline give reason to adopt a specific stance or perspective or methodology to understand memory and particularly episodic memory where roughly speaking episodic memory is a recollection of episodes once personally experienced in the past so in this case there's an episodic memory if we're believing Blasey Ford of this assault that happened in her past a recollection of this event that happened in her past so I'm going to argue that we should take a particular stance, which I'm calling the social justice stance towards memory. So this is a sort of meta philosophical project. I'm arguing that if we're going to understand memory in an adequate way, we need to be adopting a certain sort of stance towards memory. We need to be aiming to develop a conception of memory that serves the purposes, the goals of social justice and fairness. Okay, so an account of memory is only adequate in my view if it does these things. So some of you who are more interested in you know, feminist philosophy or social philosophy or metaphysics more generally might recognize that I'm endorsing an approach somewhat akin to what Sally Haslanger proposes with her ameliorative approach to social concepts. Other people have developed similar sort of approaches where the idea is that certain social concepts like woman or race should be ameliorated. They should be engineered as tools to support social justice. So my suggestion is that we should aim to develop conceptions of memory that do the same sort of thing. And any conception of memory that does not support social justice or particularly any conception that's an impediment to injustice should be deemed to be inadequate. OK, so. Looking at contemporary philosophy of memory, I thought that this was going to be a wild outlier as a view. Um, so I thought that this idea that we should take this distinctive stance towards memory, have these particular conditions and what counts as an adequate account of memory would just have no connection to what's going on right now in philosophy of memory. But I was surprised because I found some recent papers. These are two papers that were you see, published separately, but have very parallel arguments, where these philosophers of memory, sort of mainstream contemporary philosophers of memory, are arguing something along the same sort of lines without the social element. So in these two papers, it's been argued that there are multiple legitimate stances that can be taken towards 
memory and that it's possible to resolve certain debates about the nature of memory by recognizing that there are these multiple stances that can be adopted. So what these authors argue is that in philosophy of memory, you find some people who are taking a sort of empirical or descriptive stance towards memory. What they're trying to do is provide a empirically adequate description of the cognitive or the psychological or the neural mechanisms that are underpinning memories. So what they're trying to do is develop this conception of memory that fits with the science and just get to what's going on in the psychology of people when they recollect the past. But you also, it's argued by these authors, have people who are conducting a different sort of project. What they're doing is adopting a normative or an epistemic stance towards memory, where memory here is treated primarily as a source of knowledge, as something that's factive, and as a marker of authority. So on these sorts of accounts, they're concerned with the way that if you claim to remember something, it seems to be a claim to know something, you seem to be making a stake to having authority over the thing that you claim to remember. So, I mean, one way to see this is the philosophy of memory in philosophy of mind or psychology and the philosophy of memory in epistemology. That'd be one way to broadly categorize this distinction. But the idea by that's defended by these authors is that these stances don't, shouldn't really be seen to be in competition with each other. They are both legitimate stances and we can take them to be such in the accounts that are developed adopting these stances can each be legitimate and pointing towards something important. My suggestion fits with this overall project, I think, because I'm suggesting that there's a third social justice stance that is legitimate. And actually, I'll consider if I have time at the end, whether or not it should be deemed as something that's legitimate alongside these other stances. So, you know, I was looking for some friends in the literature, I kind of found something like a friend, I think, in the literature. Um, I'm also exploring a bit more how to Campbell's work relates to what I'm doing. So if anyone has any ideas about that, any of you philosophers of memory, I'd be very keen to hear it. But it's also worth noting that this here really is quite a radical departure from a lot of what's going on in philosophy of memory, where primarily there is this drive to develop accounts of memory that are fitting with what's going on in cognitive science. So on some views of memory, memory, episodic memory perhaps, or memory as a whole, or different forms of memory might be natural kinds, and you might be seeking to carve nature at its joints. Um, there's some debate about whether that's a plausible sort of approach to take. But even if you're not committed to that much, if you're a philosopher of memory, you probably are committed to this sort of empirically driven methodology where you're aiming to develop this account consistent with cognitive science. As Sarah Robbins puts it, as philosophers with a range of background interests and concerns now come together to work on memory, a unifying theme is interest in aligning our philosophical conception of memory with our best memory science. Okay, so what I'm suggesting here is a bit of a departure from that sort of view, but I don't wanna sound like I'm like, being really anti-scientific here, I'm not at all. Okay, as you'll see in my discussion later on, my argument's really driven by findings from the cognitive sciences and the sciences of memory. On my view, empirical findings are gonna be crucial. I actually don't think we should restrict ourselves just to what's going on in like neuroscience or cognitive psychology. I think also listening to accounts of people's lived experience can be really important here. We want an account of memory that's consistent with what we find out there in the sciences of memory broadly construed, I, will, I wouldn't wanna be defending an account of memory that was not consistent with the best available evidence. But my idea is that the primary goal of developing any account of memory should be this particular goal of supporting social justice and fairness. So if you have an account that doesn't do that, then that's bad. In order to do that, you're going to have to draw on empirical findings from various memory sciences. Okay, so I think one way to see this, I think this is helpful, is to see social justice as a constraint on a conception of memory, which you might develop without considering social justice as a starting point. I haven't worked out the finer details yet, so let me know if you think that's plausible. But I do think I will commit to the idea that a standard for adequacy of any account of memory should be that it supports goals of fairness and justice.
Okay, so why should we adopt this sort of stance? Here's another my argument. First of all, I'm going to point towards some ways that conceptions of memory can be crucial to securing social justice. So a large extent, I think the work is done with that initial example I've given you of Trump, but I'm going to give you some more reason to think that this is right and that it's right broadly. That is often the case that our conceptions of memory can be such that they can be implicated in injustice, but also really helpful to securing justice. Um, I'm going to argue that adopting other sorts of stances towards memory, not explicitly aiming to achieve this goal of providing an account consistent with social justice and fairness, has the potential of producing these accounts at risk actually not producing this result, actually undermining social justice and fairness goals. And so you can see the strength of my claim is quite weak here, in fact. So if we care about social justice, then we ought to seriously consider adopting this sort of stance towards memory, explicitly aiming to develop an account that supports social justice and rejecting those that don't. Okay, then. so conceptions of memory can be crucial to securing social justice and fairness. Um, I think there are two ways that this is true. There are, I think there are probably more, but I'm going to focus on two right now. Conceptions of memory I'm going to show can be really crucial to enabling people to defend their memories, the genuine memories, where this is crucial to social justice and fairness, but they can also be really important to allowing people to challenge or contest other people's claim to remember things about themselves. So it can be really important for us to be able to defend and contest genuine memories or challenging ideas as on the basis that they're not genuine memories for the purposes of social justice. Okay. So let's focus on this idea then that an adequate conception of memory can be crucial to ensuring that we can defend um, claims to remember when this is required for social justice or fairness. I think this is evident in the Blasey Ford example. Um, so imagine that you are an ally of Blasey Ford. So you want to um, defend her claim to genuinely remember that she was assaulted as a teenager, what you're going to need to make that defense successfully is a fairly sophisticated conception of what it is to remember. Perhaps you don't need all the details that are provided by that memory scientist in that article I discussed earlier, but you're going to need to be able to provide an adequate account of, of memory and perhaps one that reflects the way that stress and trauma can impact what people recollect about the past. Okay, in the absence of this sort of understanding conception of memory, there's a significant risk that the true aspects of the testimony of people like Lazy Ford will be dismissed on the basis that there are gaps, omissions or errors in what they recollect about the past. Here you can see that there are parallels with what Miranda Fricker calls the credibility deficit. You can have situations where people are given less credibility than they should be given when they're giving an account of what happened in their past. Another example of this is from a paper that I have just finally got published with my co-author Clara Sandlin on asylum seekers. In that paper, we explore the way that in the asylum system, there are certain misconceptions of memory that can come into play, leading asylum claims to be dismissed because the people who present them provide accounts that are false or contain gaps in ways that's completely understandable given the stress and trauma that people undergo in the asylum system. So without asylum caseworkers having a strong conception of what it is to remember, which they can apply when evaluating asylum claims is a significant risk in this case of people being returned to um, persecution when they have articulated that they have a need for, for protection from that persecution and provided informative accounts of their protection need. Okay, so in order to be able to defend claims to remember when it seems really important to do so for the sake of justice and fairness, we need a particular sort of conception of memory. But also sometimes it seems like it's really important to be able to challenge people's claims to remember for the same sorts of reason. So I've introduced this notion, mnemonic injustice. So this is, there's a story behind this. So I, yeah, I, I was talking to Jonathan before. I wrote this paper um, for a friend of ours 
that was is a book chapter that I finished in 2018. So the example I started off was really relevant then, not so much now. In this um, this paper, I argue that there's this phenomenon phenomenon that happens in memory that's a lot like what Frick is describing when she's talking about testimonial injustice. And we should take this phenomenon really seriously. So that paper's been like, you know, not published yet. So it's been like in, on the back burner for a while, but here I'm gonna try and get some people to have heard about it. Um, so mnemonic injustice is this effect that happens when events are recalled in a way that's fitting with stereotypes or social schemas. So this is where the stereotyping bit comes in. This is like one of the ways I got into looking at memory. So there's a vast body of psychological evidence showing that the um, associations that are made with members of certain social groups, the social schemas that people have um, that shape the way that they interact with the world can influence how events are recalled. So I'm going to give you two examples of this. And these are fairly well supported by the empirical literature. Unfortunately, I haven't given you references, but if you want any, come in my direction and I'll give them to you. So in the first example that I'm calling grand winner, you have uh, a woman in a staff meeting. It's assumed she's an academic. She is in this discussion generally about grant winning opportunities and being the wonderful colleague she is, she mentions this lucrative but fairly unknown um, grant opportunity. Um, she's heard of it because she's well networked, she's speaking to the right people and she's paying attention to these sorts of issues. She provides this information to her colleague. Um, her colleague then applies for the grant, gets promoted in a position of influence, this elevated position. But when he later recalls what happened in this meeting when he found out about this grant that has been really important to his career, he doesn't recall this person, recall Annie, as having given the information. Instead, what happens is that fitting with the stereotype associating research expertise or grant winning with men, he instead records that her male colleague provided this information, let's say James. Um, um, so in this, this, this is sort of fitting with empirical findings showing that the, the contributions that people make to discussions can be shaped by social stereotypes, whether or not their contributions are recalled can be shaped by whether or not those contributions are fitting with stereotypes about their group. In another example, um, Football fight, I'm calling here. You've got a member of a minority ethnic group who is at a, a football game and has brought two young children with him, his niece and nephew, let's say. There's a violent altercation that starts nearby. Someone involved in the altercation comes in this person's direction and he pushes this person away. So there's some physical contact, but very minimal. Um, but there's an eyewitness to this, Jean, let's say. Um, this eyewitness doesn't accurately recall what happens, but instead fills out the details of this event in a way with this, that's fitting with the stereotype and falsely recalls that this individual was quite heavily involved in the violent altercation and he wasn't. So again, there's empirical support for these effects where social schemas or stereotypes are shaping what's recalled about an event in the past. So I argue that these are cases of mnemonic injustice, where this can be understood as an injustice that occurs by human memory systems, where one person's memory system harms another person and does so in such a way that it can be deemed to be wrongful. Um, so there's an injustice. Um, so the person whose memory systems are implicated in this, so the person whose memory systems can be deemed to be unjust here, they, suffer some sort of loss because they're not recalling the past in an accurate way. So they're missing out on knowledge. So let's say Charles is a person who gets promoted, doesn't remember that Annie provided this information about the grant, then he's missing out on knowledge. But really importantly, other people undergo what could be really significant harms as a result. So let's return to Annie who's providing this information. It seems like she undergoes epistemic harms because she's providing information, knowledge that isn't given recognition. She might also undergo longest term downstream epistemic harms. For example, she might not be encouraged to apply for other grants that would allow her to do important research and produce knowledge and get recognition in that way. 
She could also undergo affective harms. So in this sort of situation, you can imagine it could be quite stressful to have this happen to you. You know, you're providing contribution to your workplace systematically over time and it's not getting recognition. Um, and there could also be significant practical harms where she's not given a promotion that she deserves because of the great contribution she's giving to the workplace, something like this. So I think that there are really important, significant similarities here between what's happening with this mnemonic in case, this case is case of memory, and testimonial injustice, which is a phenomenon that's been given like a lot of attention and um, taken to be really seriously as an injustice in the philosophy literature and beyond. What you have is harms occurring due to the morally wrongful stereotyping of an individual and the impact of that on the people who are, have their behaviours um, ripple in a way that is not accurate. So I've argued in this work for a sort of parity claim that the similarities between the harms and the causes of the harms in these sorts of cases and testimony and justice give reason to treat them both as injustices. But actually, I want to move beyond this sort of parity claim with testimony and justice. Perhaps you don't think testimonial injustice is a genuine um, injustice, or you don't think it's significant enough to be making these sorts of moves. I think there are other ways we can understand the injustice of these sorts of cases. There's a lack of recognition here of the expression of agency that these people have made. So if you have made a lot of effort to go out and find out about lucrative grants so that you can be the sort of colleague who can provide this sort of information to people, or if you've made a decision to stand back and not get involved in a violent altercation and to only like in any way get involved in protecting someone else, that's an expression of your agency. But if the recollections that other people have of that event don't reflect those choices, and it seems like you're not getting the recognition that others might get for their expressions of agency. It could be said to be a lack of acknowledgement of individuality. This is something that's said in the stereotyping literature quite a lot, that maybe one of the moral wrongs of stereotyping is that when people engage in stereotyping of other people, those other people aren't recognized as the individuals that they are, where you might think that's something really morally important. This could also contribute to a form of moral distancing, which is another thing that people talk about in the stereotyping literature. So if you have this false recollection of someone um, engaging in a violent altercation, then this is likely to lead you to have more moral distance from them, but also potentially other members of their social group or those with the same perceived social identity. So this could be another significant um, moral wrong, it seems, that's associated with these sorts of cases. Generally, I think that we can probably say that what you have in these sorts of cases is an unfair distribution of access to opportunity for recognition of what you've done and an unequal risk of harm being faced by different people due to other people's um, recollections of their behaviour. Okay, so, I mean, that's kind of a distinct paper, but that's what in here. But why is it important to the discussion that I'm putting forward today? Well, I think that this sort of case illustrates really well how conceptions of memory can be really crucial tools to supporting social justice. This sort of case, I think, shows really clearly the importance of being able to contest or challenge certain claims to remember. It seems like it's really important that people are able to say about Jean, the eyewitness, for example, that she didn't remember what she took herself to remember, that she didn't remember that this individual did this thing she takes them to have done. So this could take various forms. If you're talking about yourself, you could be saying it's really important that I can contest your claim to remember this thing about me, but you could also be making it about other people too. Okay, so if this is right, then I think this case demonstrates the value of developing concepts of memory and remembering that I allow people to contest claims to remember because this can be crucial to securing social justice and therefore shows the value of the social justice stance. So where are we? Where are we in terms of time? Uh, well, uh, you, you can take as long as you want, uh, 25 minutes at most from here. Okay. Um, so where we are is that um, social justice and fairness, it seems, require the ability to defend and contest or challenge certain claims to remember. And different conceptions of memory 
can make this easier or harder. Sometimes it seems make it impossible to do. Um, so my claim is that conceptions of memory should be developed with a view to supporting defenses of and challenges to memory, those ones that are required for social justice. At least you can make this conditional claim that if you care about social justice, then you should take it seriously that this is what we should be doing with our conceptions of memory. We should be taking this stance towards conceptualizing memory where we take a conceptualization to be adequate only if it serves these purposes. But you might have an objection at this point that I think it's kind of a sort of obvious worry, maybe you won't have it too obvious, but perhaps you have this worry that actually existing approaches as other approaches that I described at the start, that those other philosophers have been discussing, that these can actually support social justice and fairness. We don't need a specific methodology that aims to do this. And you might think particularly that all we need is a really strong scientific conception of memory that if you develop an account that's consistent with memory sciences then what you're going to do is develop an account that allows us to make these sorts of distinctions when we want to um so now i'm going to spend a bit of time saying why that that objection doesn't work um, um and this is going to push further this idea that social justice stance is important by considering the limitations of other approaches such as the approaches that are really driven by the empirical sciences, hopefully it should become even clearer how important it is to develop this sort of stance. Okay, so remember there are two stances that were argued to be legitimate by these authors in the literature, the empirical or descriptive stance and the epistemic or normative stance. Let's start off with the empirical or descriptive stance because I'm gonna be dealing with this potential objection that what we just need is to develop an account consistent with the sciences. So this sort of approach does this. So it focuses on understanding the psychological capacities that produce recollections of the past. The primary aim on this sort of approach is to build an account that's consistent with the memory sciences. And many people who are adopting this sort of approach endorse simulationism. So I'm gonna talk about simulationism here. It happens that both of these papers sort of endorse simulationism as the main sort of empirical or descriptive stance towards memory, there are other views, but hopefully by considering how people have developed this simulationist view of memory and in line with findings from cognitive sciences, but the account isn't consistent with supporting the goals of social justice and fairness, we will find reason to think more generally adopting this sort of methodology risks producing results that are inconsistent with supporting social justice and fairness. So what is simulationism? So some of you who work on memory will be very familiar with this. Perhaps many others of you are less so. Um, simulationism is the view that those cognitive mechanisms that underpin recollections of the past, actually what they do is they produce simulations or imaginings of events. And the idea is that these same cognitive mechanisms produce simulations or imaginings of the future and hypothetical events as well as events in the past. So remembering on the simulationist view, certainly that of Gorka Michaelian, is imagining events in one's personal past, although there's been that condition's also been dropped recently, but imagining events in one's personal past via a reliable cognitive mechanism Forming its proper function. So those of you who are more epistemology inclined might notice that what's going on here is an appeal to reliability and reliabilism. The idea is that if you're having this imagining of your personal past and the mechanism that's producing it is reliable, then this means that it is a memory. Okay, so this theory has been sort of developed in response to empirical evidence and finds some support from that evidence. So some evidence in support of simulationism is that damage to the hippocampus, to the same areas of the hippocampus negatively impacts both imagining and remembering. So you've got this, this single like impact on this brain region and it's impacting both imagining and remembering, suggesting that in fact, there's a, a common network of brain activation that's responsible for both remembering and imagining. And it's been fine, found that where you've got experimental participants engaging in the, this process of predicting the future, 
or recollect in the past, you have the same brain activation in both of the So this suggests that some processes that are responsible for future planning occur in the same neural regions as those responsible for remembering. There's also this mental time travel view in cognitive science, according to which there's a single capacity that allows us to protect, project ourselves into the future and also into the past. So there's this body of empirical research that's taken to support this idea that remembering is imagining, it's this capacity to imagine the future, the past, but also hypothetical events. Okay, so there are empirical findings supporting this view. I think there are also very good reasons to think that this view, supported by those empirical findings, runs a risk of producing results that account for so to social justice and fairness. Okay, particularly, I think there's reason to think that simulationism could produce a result that these recollections I've described in Football Fight and Grant Winner, which I've argued is really important to be able to contest, actually turn out to be genuine memories on this account. Because the process that I've described as responsible for this scheme as shaping what's re recollected about the past could be viewed to be a reliable belief forming process. Now, of course, when it comes to reliability, those of us who've been thinking about the stuff know that you can splice things up in different ways, so you can find different processes to evaluate. I can go into the details of why I'm focusing on this level of generality and evaluating it for reliability, if you like, but there are time constraints, so I'm gonna sort of skim over this for the moment and just provide some reason for thinking that this process of producing recollections of the past that's consistent with schemas can be viewed to be a reliable process. So here are some reasons. And again, we're appealing to the empirical literature here. So there's evidence suggesting that actually um, the existence of social schemas and their influence on recollection actually is fairly supportive of the process of storage and retrieving information. So you have these schemas that are existing in brain um, and these it seems allow schema congruent information consistent as information that's consistent with a schema or a stereotype so information for example about someone who is in a group that's stereotyped as violent displaying some action that could be interpreted as violent that information is really easily assimilated into existing knowledge in the person's brain so it seems like the schemas are helping in a way the information to be stored and also it's been argued that schemas allow access to information that's stored in memory. So they kind of provide a route into information. So again, this provides reason to think that actually these schemas are facilitating memory. They're facilitating the retrieval of information from memory systems. There's also um, recent work um, from neuroscience suggesting that the process of consolidation that happens in memory where you have um, memories moving from a sort of labile state where they're kind of adaptable and could be changed to becoming more stable. This process is actually more effective when you've got social schemas or schemas in play. And also, whereas loss of sleep and other sorts of interference might prevent this process of consolidation, the formation of stable memories happening, this is actually less likely when you've got information that's consistent with the schemas. Okay, so if all of this is right, then it's, there seems to be evidence suggesting that schema effects, this way the schemas shape what's recollected about the past, that this produces a high ratio of true beliefs that actually supports recollections of the past. So you might move from that sort of observation to the conclusion that the process is a reliable one. Then it seems like if you're adopting this sort of reliableist approach, where something is a, a memory if it's reliably formed, there seems to be reason to think that recollections of the past that are produced by these sorts of effects are genuine memories. But it seems like we didn't want that result, right? We wanted to be able to deny that where you have these recollections of the past that are shaped by social skin schemas, they are genuine memories we wanted to say that they weren't genuine memories and yet it's really difficult if we accept that they're produced by reliable processes now of course you might point to the way that these 
recollections of the past are inaccurate. There are some inaccuracies in these recollections, of course. You know, you've got someone recollected as having um, given information about a grant when they didn't, um, someone not remembered as having done so when they did. But on these sorts of approaches, it's generally accepted that memories have some inaccuracies in some level of inaccuracy. It's consistent with remembering the past that you have a recollection that's inaccurate. So then I think that what we have here is an account that's developed on the basis of scientific evidence, findings from cognitive science, um, that at least, you know, a number of people working in philosophy of memory find really appealing because it fits with the empirical sciences, but it doesn't allow us to challenge memories in the ways that it seems like we might want to. And so this puts pressure on the idea that all we need to do is depend on the science. Depending on the science has the potential to produce a result that accounts of memory are endorsed that actually undermine certain social justice goals. So then the lesson from this then is that there's a risk that conceptions of memory developed to fit memory science fail to support, even undermine contestations of, or challenges of memory that are required for social justice. Okay, so maybe just depending on the science isn't enough, but there was another sort of stance that was deemed legitimate by these authors who we were talking about earlier, the epistemic or normative stance. So if you're an epistemologist, maybe this is how you're inclined to think about memory anyway. Um, you might think of memory as not a psychological capacity, but instead as a source of knowledge and think that it's only really right to be ascribing knowledge to people in these cases or any other cases, if it seems as if, so memory, if, the, if it seems that they know. Um, and this might seem to sort of get to the problem that I've identified with the, the simulationist view, the sort of empirical view. It might seem like the right diagnosis of what's been happening so far is that empirical or descriptive accounts aren't ensuring epistemic authority is dished out in the right way. So some people are being treated as authorities about matters, like what happened in, in a football fight or what happened in a, a work meeting when they shouldn't have been. And so approaches that explicitly focused on ensuring that accounts of memory only ascribe memory when people should be deemed to have epistemic authority, that those sort of approaches can avoid these sorts of problems without us having to adopt a social justice stance, okay? So could accounts that treat memory primarily as a source of knowledge avoid these sorts of problems? If remembering is taken to be a mark of authority, will this produce a result that in things like grant winner and football fight, those people who are making the claims to remember won't be treated as remembering because they're not genuine authorities? Well, again, unsurprisingly, I want to say no. So I think that considering an example, again, it's useful. Um, remember that what's being said here on this epistemic or normative stance is that remembering isn't only the psychological capacity for simulation. Instead, remembering is factive, it's an epistemic achievement. It's a marker of epistemic authority. The way that Craver spells out the details of this sort of stance is that remembering doesn't just require the capacity to remember, so to imagine, or how, how people understand remembering on the empirical or descriptive stance, it requires additional capacities. So you might be able to imagine the future, imagine the past, but to remember on this sort of approach, you need to be able to do things like form commitments, about events that aren't occurring right now. Um, you need to be able to acquire norms of truth telling. So you need to understand what is expected in truth telling. You need to be able to evaluate those norms of truth telling, understand whether or not those norms are being adhered to. You need to be able to justify what you're taking to remember according to these norms. Well, I think the problem with this sort of stance is that if you think about how you might apply this stance, then you're going to end up understanding that what happens is that 
when you're applying this stance, you're going to be evaluating whether people are making use of these broader set of capacities. So does a person remember, well, are they adhering to the norms of truth telling? Do they seem to have a grasp of those norms of truth telling? Do they seem to be in a position to make a commitment in relation to what they're claiming about, such that it's going to line up with how we think people should behave if they're telling the truth? Well, I think if we approach people's recollections of the past in this way, then we're probably going to end up making judgments that undermine people's ability to defend their claims to remember, when in fact it seems important that they should be taken to remember. So, there will be cases, I think, where you've got the appearance of people failing to meet these standards or these additional requirements of fitting the norms of truth-telling, and yet we still want to say that they genuinely remember. It's important that we do. And yet adopting this sort of stance will lead them to be taken not to remember. Okay. And we can understand this through this example of lazy forward again. So I think that if you're applying this stance, you're assuming that remembering involves not only imagining the past, but something over and above that, understanding norms of truth telling and adhering to them and justifying your recollections in line with them, then I think these cases where you have evidence that people are providing accounts that contain errors and omissions, in these sorts of cases, those sorts of forms of evidence are likely to be taken to undermine people's claims to remember. Because, for example, in the Blasey Ford case, it seems likely that people will conclude that she's actually violated norms of truth telling because she's providing this account that contains these gaps. And perhaps in many cases, recollections like this will contain inaccuracies. So people like this, I think, will find it difficult to justify their beliefs, show how they fit with the norms of truth telling, given that their recollections of the past are likely to contain some falsity or emissions. So if you imagine what we expect of other people if we're taking them to be meeting the norms of truth telling, it's likely that we're going to expect of them that they provide relevant information and that they meet our demands for information. So if someone is claiming to remember a particular event in their past, you might think that doing that Doing that in a way that genuinely involves remembering involves the capacity to be able to defend that claim. And people should be able to demand details like, well, how did you get home? So if you're claiming that you were assaulted in order to be meeting the norms of truth telling, it might be thought that you need to be able to meet those demands. But people in cases like Lazy Fords are going to struggle to do so. OK, so I think that if you apply this sort of framework, this sort of epistemic or normative framework, you're going to have people like Lazy Ford having their whole testimony dismissed and challenged and denied to be genuine examples of remembering because of the stringency of the requirements that are placed on remembering. So if you apply this sort of framework, then it might be made difficult or impossible for people like Lazy Ford to defend their claims that they genuinely remember when it seems crucial that if they are providing an account of the core details of an example and the sort that happened in the past that they are believed. Okay, so I think then we also can't depend on the adoption of the epistemic or normative stance to secure social justice, that doing so risks not having the situation where people can claim to remember, but they shouldn't be taken to remember, but instead it risks genuine recollections of the past being dismissed on the basis that they're not meeting stringent standards of truth telling. I, there are other sorts of risks on the other side of things, but if you want to ask me about that, then do, we have no time for it right now. Okay, so where are we? I provided reason to think conceptions of memory can be crucial to securing social justice, and hopefully given reasons for thinking that other stances that you might take towards memory that don't involve explicitly aiming to develop an account consistent with social justice, risk not securing those social justice goals and sometimes undermining them. So I think if we care about social justice, we ought to seriously consider adopting a social justice stance. Now, there are a couple of options that we have at this point. So one thing you might do is say, okay, so 
Kathy opened this talk discussing these papers where it's argued that there are two legitimate stances that you can take towards memory. Maybe we should just be more inclusive and just open it up and say that there's a third legitimate stance that can be taken towards memory, the social justice stance. So the social justice stance might just be taken to be one perspective that you can take towards memory, where if you're adopting that perspective, your goal is to develop an account that's consistent with social justice and fairness. But I actually don't think that this is desirable. I mean, if I persuaded you of that much, then great, brilliant. I that to be a success, but I don't think that is quite adequate. I don't think this is desirable. And I think, this is because adopting this sort of approach is going to significantly weaken those challenges to claims to remember and also significantly weaken defences of memory. And I think that this is clear if we return to the football fight case. So I'm calling this individual in that case Tyreek. So Tyreek is this individual who's pushed someone away to protect his niece and nephew, but otherwise not got involved in this violent altercation. So imagine that the eyewitness to that is able to truthfully say, I remember Tyreek being involved in that violent altercation and being more heavily involved in that than he really was. According to the empirical stance on memory or according to the epistemic or normative stance on memory, that's true. It seems like that isn't what we wanna say. It seems like it's really important that we can contest, deny outright that that is an example of remembering. But if we allow that there are multiple legitimate stances, according to some of those stances, it might well be the case. In fact, I would argue it would be the case that this recollection would count as a memory. I think similar could be said about the other cases too. I've been thinking about this. I just added this today. So let me know what you think about it. I actually think it's an issue of respect and human dignity that people should be able to challenge those sorts of claims. So really, if you are that individual and you've had an accusation made against you, someone is claiming that you were more violent than you were due to a pernicious social stereotype about your social group, it seems like it's important that you are able to challenge that. And it seems important that other people take that seriously enough that they develop conceptions of memory that allow you to do that. Um, it seems like out of respect for those people who are subject to those forms of pernicious stereotyping and might have those um, behaviours that they display falsely recalled in this really pernicious way, that we should aim to, in fact, adopt a stance according to which memory doesn't, the concept of memory doesn't apply in these sorts of cases. Um, so let me know what you think about that. I just think that like there's something in like in my gut tells me that's the wrong result, that we shouldn't have any account according to which people can say that they genuinely remember that sort of thing. But kept putting my finger on exactly what the, the wrong of it is. It's difficult to do, but I think it's something about just basic respect and human dignity. Okay, so if you buy any of that, then I think that these concerns for social justice could reasonably lead us to move away from the empirical and descriptive and normative or epistemic stances altogether and solely endorse the social justice stance. And this would be really to ameliorate the concept of memory, not to just allow that there can be these other concepts floating around that are doing work, but instead abandon those other approaches altogether and just develop this concept of memory remembering that aims at ameliorating. Yes. So I, I think like one, if I was objecting to me right now, I, mean, I probably have lots of things to be honest. I won't tell you what they are, but I'm sure there are many things I could come up with. Um, but one objection would be that it seems like kind of the proof is in the pudding with this sort of approach. So I'm arguing for a sort of methodology, but what is it gonna look like to adopt this sort of stance? What sort of account is gonna come out the other end? And the simple answer is I don't really know yet. So I'm still trying to work out the details. But I think looking at these sorts of cases are a few things that we can conclude. It's going to be really important that this account that we produce aiming to support social justice goals is informed by memory sciences, because so much of what I've said so far, where I think we are making progress towards understanding what conceptions of memory can be implicated in justice, but also helpful, really is informed by those sciences. And I think our understandings of memory have made a lot of progress as a result of working the sciences. But I think that it's unlikely that this conception of memory is going to carve nature at its joints. Um, so 
I think it's going to be a fairly fine grained approach, for example, when it comes to social schemas or the schema effects on memory, I think that we're probably going to be end up allowing that some of the products of those sorts of effects turn out to be genuine examples of remembering, because it seems like schemas are really important to facilitating memory, but we're going to want to say that some some recollections of the past shaped by these things are not because we want to say that the recollections in like in ground winner and football fight are not genuine memories so um similarly when it comes to constructive memory mechanisms there's a lot of work suggesting that memory is constructive we don't have records of the parts stored away like we might do word documents on a laptop instead what we have is this process of construction that happens when we retrieve information from the past so on one version of this sort of simulationist view, if those mechanisms are reliable, then the products turn out to be memories. So you might think that all of the products of constructive memory systems are going to turn out to be memories. I don't think that's going to work out either. So I think it's going to be quite a fine grained approach and totally informed. But beyond that, if you have any ideas, let me know. OK, so the concept of memory is crucial to securing social justice allowing people to effectively defend and challenge claims to remember in ways that support social justice and fairness. Accounts are focused on describing the cognitive mechanisms of the psychological underpinnings of memory, all the epistemic features of memory. Without considering social justice, I want to argue, are likely to undermine or at least not solve um, these defenses and contestations of memory when they're required for social justice. So I think that if you're concerned with social justice, put your hands up. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, um, if you're concerned with social justice, then you should take seriously the possibility that social justice stance on memory is required. Um, and a conception of memory should be developed explicitly aiming to support the goals of social justice. That's me. Thank you.